After one year of fighting, how is Ukraine today? How has the world felt the conflict? And who has the key to end the crisis? Game changers. I'm Xu Qinduo. Here in Ukraine, we take a close look at the conflict. Join us for our special report, Conflict and Order, Decoding the Ukraine Crisis, only on CGTN. In Leo Tolstoy's classic novel, War and Peace, Nikolai Rostov wonders how his mother would feel if she saw him on the battlefield with cannons aimed at him. Just outside Kyiv, both Russian and Ukrainian soldiers may have felt those same horrors during the early days of the conflict. Well, tens of thousands have been killed on the battlefields but missiles and drones have torn the impressive landscape to pieces. In the past year, there have been over 18,000 civilian casualties in Ukraine, with more than 7,000 people killed. An estimated 5.7 million school-aged children have been directly affected. On the other side of the conflict, the number of Russian soldiers killed and wounded continues to mount. Western sanctions, unprecedented in terms of the scale, have led to the isolation of the Russian economy and an outflow of capital as well as businesses and could have a deeper impact going forward. The conventional wisdom in the West has long been that uh, Vladimir Putin was an imperialist and he was determined to conquer Ukraine and make it part of a greater Russia, or he was interested in recreating the Soviet Union. There is no evidence to support that. And all the evidence indicates that he was fearful that the West was trying to make Ukraine a bulwark, a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And, and the principal element of the West strategy was NATO expansion into Ukraine. Putin and his advisors made it clear for many years that this was simply unacceptable. And if the West continued to push NATO eastward into Ukraine, there would be serious trouble. If you go back to the creation of Ukraine, Ukraine was accepted as a sovereign state by Russia in 1991, along with all other members of the United Nations. In 1994, Russia, together with the United States and the United Kingdom, signed a memorandum in Budapest saying that they would always support the security and integrity of Ukraine if Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. And Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. And of course, that Budapest agreement um, <coughs> was simply forgotten. As the conflict drags on, it has triggered seismic repercussions. The first fallout is the massive refugee crisis. According to the United Nations, more than 6.5 million people are estimated to be internally displaced in Ukraine. Over 8 million Ukrainian refugees have relocated across Europe. During the first 14 days of the war, over 2 million Ukrainians fled the country. People were initially sympathetic to the plight of these refugees and even hosted them in their homes. I was so scared about how, how it would be here, so many uh, refugees, so many people, and so cold. But yesterday, when I come through the uh, border, with all these people, all these Romanian people, like in, in angel, angels, they take us of, took us with their uh, <laughs> rings. Rings, rings, yeah, and um, and surrounded, and surrounded us with such a man warm and hospitality and love and they do everything that our suffering would be less. But the war has dragged on with no end in sight. Such generosity has gradually grown into distress, hardship and helplessness. And we will obviously be ready to help them, but what we are already facing is unprecedented, is incomparable to anything that Europe has experienced post-World War II. There is something like uh, compassion fatigue, and uh, basically it's difficult to, to maintain this high level of involvement and support 
for long uh, term. European leaders have kept a low profile on this issue. While they implement refugee-friendly policies, it's difficult to maintain public support for Ukrainian access to labor markets and social benefits. Currently, people in Warsaw are worried over the economic situation and inflation, and some are voicing irritation by what they perceive as favorable treatment of the Ukrainian refugees. As the cost of living has spiked across the EU, refugee fatigue has turned into acts of outright hostility and demonstrations over the cost of living crisis. With the growing financial burden of helping Ukrainian refugees, the broader future of assistance is increasingly unclear. Since there is no end in sight to the ongoing conflict, the prospect of further arrivals from Ukraine could put even greater strain on the authorities. I have worked in refugee crisis for almost 40 years, and I have rarely seen such an incredibly fast rising exodus of people. I regret to say that unless there is an immediate halt to conflict, Ukrainians will simply continue to flee. The Ukraine conflict has also ravaged the European economy, disrupting the flow of goods between Russia and Ukraine, pumping up inflation to levels not seen before, dimming prospects of the region's post-pandemic recovery and even pushing many into poverty. Europe is already bracing for what could be a long, cold winter. Aimed at tackling the energy crisis, it's driving up the cost of living. This is, of course, something which every single European has on its mind right now. We have suffered uh, very high inflation, uh, uh, pretty much uh, because uh, of uh, either some sanctions or some threat of sanctions that the EU wanted to impose on the imports of energy from Russia, partly oil and largely gas. So even the announcement of potential sanctions without even doing it has pushed prices up. And we have experienced at around the 10% inflation, so this has hurt directly the individual citizen of uh, Europe, especially in Italy and Germany, that relied a lot on imports uh, from Russia. They had seen the, uh, you know, the bill, the utility bill uh, doubling, even trebling in some situations. So this is for the household and businesses uh, also, because of course the businesses live on sometimes on thin margins, talking about shops, uh, restaurants. Uh, so the whole value chain, uh, uh, think of it uh, making flowers, baking to make the bread and selling the bread in a bakery, has completely disrupted this relationship because of energy prices. So EU has paid a very, very high cost for this without really helping the peace process. So it's been lose, lose situation. After one year of fighting, how is Ukraine today? How has the world felt the conflict? And who has the key to end the crisis? Game changers. I'm Xu Qinduo. Here in Ukraine, we take a close look at the conflict. Join us for our special report, Conflict and Order, Decoding the Ukraine Crisis, only on CGTN. Europe is struggling now. They need gas, which the U.S. has helped to supply Europe with, but at four times the cost Americans pay. They need military equipment after sending their own to Ukraine which they order from U.S. manufacturers. It seems that the EU has little choice but to side with its U.S. ally, getting further pulled away from European strategic autonomy. Europe will not have extra uh, sources of uh, oil and gas that they used to buy with very good and cheap prices, in fact, from Russia. And they basically replicate what the Americans tell them to do. And this is in terms of NATO and in terms of the European Union. The way things work here in Europe is basically the Americans give orders, NATO relays these orders to the European Union, and the European Commission, which is the legislative body of the EU, they disseminate that to the 27 EU members. This is how it works. This is something that an average uh, uh, European citizens will never see printed in their newspapers or watch on TV. But this is how the system actually works. To make matters worse, 
EU leaders are now complaining about the U.S.'s new Inflation Reduction Act, a trade bill to promote clean production and innovation of clean technologies, but with a catch. Subsidies are given only if production is U.S.-based and on sourcing inputs from North America. The EU says this violates international trade rules in a package that Brussels fears could tilt trade away from the EU at the worst possible time. The U.S. is following a domestic agenda, which is regrettably protectionist and discriminates against U.S. allies, said Tonino Pecula, the European Parliament's coordinator on the transatlantic relationship. But it's not just Europe which is feeling the pain from the conflict. Even those countries that have chosen to stay neutral, such as most of the global south, they are also feeling the negative impacts of this conflict in a very real way. Ukraine grows enough food to feed 400 million people on planet Earth. So when the farmers on the battlefields aren't planting or aren't harvesting, what impact do you think that's going to have? So the compounding shock, if you, if you want, of the war in Ukraine may cause severe outcomes for vulnerable people in several Middle East, North African countries if the humanitarian and development assistance are not scaled up. And so as, again and again, whenever we have these crises, it is the poor that suffer the most. The poor are indeed suffering. Thousands of miles away in Sri Lanka, the surging global fuel and food prices caused by the conflict have turned the small country's uphill economic struggle into something insurmountable. Earlier, my husband used to earn 1,500 rupees, but now he stays at home because of the petrol shortage. If we borrow, it becomes a loan. We feed the children and we also can eat, but we would have to get into debt to live. We only have a little sugar, no other food. If we borrow money from someone, we have to pay it. I'm scared to borrow because I have no way of paying it back. I'm afraid that uh, Sri Lanka is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think I've said previously that um, you know these sanctions um, do kill people. Uh, and probably we're going to see more people dying outside of Ukraine than probably inside Ukraine. Uh, and you're going to see these people dying uh, in um, developing countries. I mean, the, the bottom social strata people who are struggling, who don't have income for months, and now you you know you see these skyrocketing prices of uh, food uh, and fuel. So uh, it, 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 it's, just, it's just going to be a toll uh, on the part of uh, many uh, developing countries that rely on these imports. So um, it, it's, uh, it's very unfortunate. And in Africa, the promising recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic was disrupted by the interrupted trade of goods and services, which caused a tightened fiscal space and reduction in the flow of development finance. But though these economic troubles are indeed significant, they don't compare to the greatest threat of all from this crisis, the use of nuclear weapons. A group of Nobel laureates have recently warned that the escalation in wars and the military action has brought Europe much closer to this threat. We in the West are in this paradoxical situation where we are trying to defeat the Russians in Ukraine but the more successful we are at achieving that goal, the more likely it is that nuclear weapons would be used. And that, of course, would be an unmitigated disaster. We do not want that to happen. All of this just tells you how much trouble we are in. In January, one month before the one-year anniversary of the conflict, Doomsday Clock, which was created to illustrate how close humanity is to Armageddon, moved to just 90 seconds before midnight, taking 10 seconds closer than it had been for the past three years. This clock in Kiev has so far survived the devastation of the conflict. But as the conflict continues to escalate, can we be so lucky and stop the clock before time runs out? Now, this is the closest the clock has ever stood to humanity's darkest hour and closer than even during the height of the Cold War. In truth, the doomsday clock is a global alarm clock. We need to wake up, 
and get to work. Gating roads rise in how walls end that every wall goes through three phases, the opening attack, the struggle for advantage, and the end game. Though experts and scholars have wrestled with how the conflict may finally end, one year later, it's clear there is still no end in sight. Russia has said it's ready to talk with Ukraine, but there must be no preconditions. Duh. Yes, the classics say that any military action ends in negotiations, and we, of course, have already said that we will be ready for such negotiations. But only to negotiations without preconditions, negotiations based on the reality that exists, negotiations taking into account the goals that we voiced publicly. After one year of fighting, how is Ukraine today? How has the world felt the conflict? And who has the key to end the crisis? Game changers. I'm Xu Qinduo. Here in Ukraine, we take a close look at the conflict. Join us for our special report, Conflict and Order, Decoding the Ukraine Crisis, only on CGTN. The risk of a direct clash is always there. I'm, I'm hopeful that that will not happen, but unfortunately there's not much talk about dipl a diplomatic solution uh, right now. Um, the Ukrainians have made it clear that they expect to reconquer the entire extent of their territory within the 90, 1991 borders, which means reconquering um, uh, the Crimea. The West seems to be, in terms of narrative, uh, supporting the Ukrainians, although we don't know what's happening behind closed doors. So maybe there are other more nuanced uh, conversations going on. But again, I think that this spring going into the summer, um, we may see a change in uh, rhetoric as uh, the war becomes unsustainable, first and foremost, of course, for the Ukrainians. What the Americans and their allies are doing is they're doubling down at every turn. And this is why you see so much escalation in this conflict. Uh, the Americans are looking for ways to defeat the Russians in Ukraine and to badly damage the Russian economy. What the Americans are trying to do is they're trying to knock the Russians out of the ranks of the great powers. This, of course, is why, from Russia's point of view, uh, what the West is doing represents an existential threat. And we do more and more every week to up the ante. And all this does is cause the Russians to do more and more to up the ante. So both sides are upping the ante more and more each week. You have this spiral mechanism at play. What is behind uh, behind this war? If, if there had not been the attempt to expand NATO, there would not have been the war. So I'm afraid the war will probably only come to an end when the United States realizes that this is an extremely dangerous and bad idea and stops the attempt to expand NATO. It was warned against this by very serious people inside the United States, but it hasn't desisted from it. And I'm afraid the crisis will continue as long as the US continues on this disastrous course. US President Joe Biden made a surprise trip to Kiev and announced new military assistance. The signal was clear, showing support, but it's difficult to predict how long that will last with a growing fissure among Republicans over aid to Ukraine. There is a big separation and big split between the politicians who don't feel any fatigue because they benefit from military industrial complex, they benefit for wrapping themselves into banners and pretending to be heroes, and common people who realize that they are paying taxes, a lot of taxes. Maybe by 2024, there will be enough pressure and Republican candidates will say that we don't want to waste our available resources on this. I also think that certain things will have to change in the mindset of European and American politicians. We have endless amount of problems facing the world, from climate to COVID to anything. We need cooperation rather than ostracizing, maligning, uh, treating other countries as pariahs. So sooner or later, politicians will understand this drift too. W will it happen by 2024? I hope so, but you know, it's, it's not guaranteed. But fatigue will take over sooner or later. 
Well, the sharp increase is a, a, a sign of something that the United States government has never uh, made a secret of, which is that it is the main supplier of weapons to uh, Ukraine. I think there will be a fall of support in weapon sales to Ukraine before the election of 2024, because uh, Ukraine is slowly being displaced from the center of the foreign policy narrative in the United States already. And it actually has less to do with the Republicans and with the slim majority that they actually enjoy in Congress right now than it has to do with the uh, historical sort of uh, uh, length of the American public's um, uh, attention uh, span. By pushing in more and more weapons in Ukraine, they are simply pushing for the killing of more and more and more people. They are prolonging the war. What is needed now is not pushing more weapons into Ukraine, but getting to the negotiating table to end that war. That war is unnecessary, is costly in terms of human life, is costly in terms of economic resources. Yes, American enterprises, those in the military, are making a lot of money. The military industrial complex is making a lot of money and they want wars everywhere. A quiet Cold War has existed between the West and Russia for years as NATO steadily expanded eastward despite Russia's warnings. And now relations between Russia and Europe are at an all-time low and the global order may be fundamentally altered. If you look at the consequences of this war uh, for Europe, uh, it's... Uh, a very uh, disturbing uh, picture. Uh, I think that relations between Russia and Europe, and this includes not just Eastern Europe, but Western Europe, uh, are now poisonous. Both sides are going to have uh, all sorts of incentives to cause the other side trouble. And this means that uh, it's hard to see how you're gonna get a stable and peaceful Europe uh, in the foreseeable future. Well, I think it has uh, changed tremendously the international order in that uh, we are stepping into a world of two cold wars. Uh, I mean, in Europe, of course, we are witnessing a hot war raging on, but uh, we can s tell after this war what will happen. Definitely, there's a re-emergence of a cold war scenario of, of uh, Russia on one side and the rest of Europe on the other side. The Ukraine conflict has shattered the fragile relationship between Russia and Europe since the post-Soviet era. Without strong economic and energy ties to bind them, suspicion and mistrust will cast a dark fog over the future of regional and international peace and security. China is not a party to this crisis in Ukraine, but we are not standing idly by, nor are we throwing fuel on the fire we are more opposed to profiting from the fire. What China is doing, as I said earlier, is to urge peace and promote talks. We will stand firmly on the side of peace and on the side of dialogue. We will continue to promote peace talks, contribute ideas for a political settlement of the Ukraine crisis, and join the international community to promote dialogue and consultation, address the concerns of all parties, and seek common security. China recognized from the very start that there were true security interests on both sides, Ukraine and Russia, that need to be observed in order for this war to end, and that they can be observed, that they should be reflected and respected through dialogue and negotiation, and that continued war and escalation was dangerous, devastating for Ukraine, and unnecessary. This idea of the common destiny of humanity is absolutely fundamental from immediate point of view and from fundamental economic point of view. The, the alternative to this, which is the US concept really of zero sum game, is exactly what is created in this type of um, danger which exists in the situation. One year on, peace still remains out of sight. For Russia, Ukraine cannot be a part of the West. For Ukraine, they want to choose their own future. For America, they want to see a weakened Russia. For Europe, they want to have stable economies and security. 
For the rest of the world, people want steady trade and prosperity. The Ukraine conflict may have taught us all a lesson that confrontation and a Cold War mentality only to conflict and should be abandoned at all costs. Instead, peaceful coexistence, a live and let live attitudes, and the building of a common community with a shared future for all is the best way forward for this and the future generations. We all live in this world, therefore, we all deserve to have a say in its future. I feel that the conflict impacts many things, not just the countries involved, but the entire global community. I wish for it to be over, or at least find a solution. The whole world says it's a crisis, globally, economically, we're facing crisis. But I think we can live through the day because of hope. We're living with the hope that tomorrow will be a bit better, so if we don't let go of that hope, I think we can overcome the difficulties.